All right. So thank you. Thank you, John, for the introduction. I'd like to first of all thank um, John and Gang for, for, for allowing me to, uh, to present. It's, it's an honor, big honor for me to be part of it. Um, I also would like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at Restfrag. So, so first of all, very, very big thanks for giving me this opportunity, just opportunity to develop this, something new and very exciting. Um, and also at some point I'll be showing some, uh, you know, nice images which use uh, in Restfrag uh, user interface. And of course, I mean, that's, um, that's you know, big thanks for all the people, all the hard work who are uh, working on this UI interface. That's, that's their work. That's, Will allow me to you know to show these results. Okay, well, let's start with a oh, sorry, let's, with a, uh, this funny disclaimer, right? So um, be aware there are going to be some mathematics involved uh, today, uh, but this is just just a way of saying this. It's 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 a technical talk. Is uh, I was supposed to be a technical talk, and um, I'll try to make it um, as you know people friendly as possible. Try to explain things, but you know some things will require you know, some equations and, and so just be aware that they um, are gonna be there, okay? So we're talking about hydraulic fracturing and um, continuous versus discrete front tracking, right? So let's let's first define what we're talking about and then see how we can improve it. So in continuous you approach, you explicitly track the fracture front, right? So basically your, your, uh, your fracture length, right? Is, is, is like a continuous function, right? So it could be anything, right? Any number. And, and if you have like fixed mesh, so your fracture front can be at the beginning of the element in the middle or at the end or somewhere in between. In the discrete, on the other hand, you open one element at a time in the sense that your fracture length, if, if you think about fracture length is discrete, right? So you open the element, now your fracture length suddenly jumps, right? It effectively jumps by a certain amount, which is equal to your element length, right? So these are just, just two main um, you know, conceptual differences. So I'll talk about the continuous and do just a little bit of literature you just give you a history background. Uh, one of the first one that I'm aware of, again, using the fixed mesh, okay? So because of course you can use a moving mesh for, for simple cases like KGD or PKN fracture, or you can do just moving mesh to try to match the, um, uh, the fracture geometry. I exclude all these cases just when you have a fixed mesh and then you try to kind of track your fracture front within this fixed mesh. So one of the first that I'm aware of is uh, VOF method, right? So I developed, uh, you know, in, in, in Schlumberger, right? So it was Sibris and Pierce. And then later on, um, you know, Anthony Pierce uh, went ahead to develop, as far as I know, and like a, like a better algorithm, right? So that's what he told me at least. So it's, so, so, so it's a better algorithm than the previous one. And so he called it ILSA, implicit, implicit level set algorithm. And then we were, there were quite a few follow-ups um, just because the original algorithm was for for displacement discontinuity, and then there was uh, and for single fraction, then there were some extensions for finite elements, multiple frags, and so on. Um, and um, right, so that's 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 continuous. Again, there are not a whole lot of studies, but but there are some. Okay, and discrete is basically everybody else, right? So the, the vast majority of simulators, academic or commercial, are discrete, right? Because I mean, it could be finite element, extended finite element, discrete element methods. Uh, you know anything, pretty much anything. Right? I mean, I even put a face field, but you know they use fairly small element size in you know, the fracture, so probably it's close to continuous. But uh, pretty much, you know, ninety nine percent of all simulators are, are, are discrete. And this is like an example from Restfrag, right? You can clearly see these, you know, the elements. You know, just get screenshots from the website, um, and just, just to highlight that you just open one element at a time, and your fracture grows at one element at a time. Okay. Um, so let me. Talk a little bit about ILSA, right? Because um, again, this is, as you can see, this is uh, the latest and the greatest um, so far algorithm for tracking the fracture front. Okay, and so, so here is, so, you know, are you able to see my mouse? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. So here you have a, a two-dimensional fracture, planar fracture. Here is black as a fracture front. And now you define the tip elements as those partially filled and crossed by the fracture front. And you have the zero elements, so one layer behind, which are fully open. And the idea of ILSA is that your uh, survey elements, so one is fully filled, are uniquely de define the behavior of the tip elements. So the tip elements are not independent elements, they're not independent variables, they're fully dependent on, on the internal elements, all right? So that's the key. And the main idea is that um, uh, this, uh, you compute you use the width, like if you look at this lower left part of the fracture, 
you take the width of this server element and knowing this width, all this width controls uh, the distance to the front. Okay, let me give you an example. If you have um, toughness domination, so your your width near the fracture front uh, behaves according to this equation. You have your toughness, Young's models, Poisson, and S is distance to the front. So you increase the width, you increase the distance accordingly, right? So, so, so you invert this function, now, now you get your distance of the front as a function of the width, right? And now you use all the widths, all the data of all the server elements, and now you define the fracture front. Now, if you increase the width, you pump a little bit more fluid, now your width increases, your distance increases, and that's how you increase this, right? And that's how you propagate the fraction, okay? And, and then there are extensions. So this is like for just for toughness solution. If you want to account for the effect of very strong pressure drop due to fluid viscosity near basically between the survey and the tip elements, then you use some, some more complicated expression, um, also called um, uh, three process tip asymptote. And that's actually, that was my, my contribution uh, to this field uh, when I was working with Anthony Pierce uh, back at TBC days. And the idea that you solve the problem of semi-infinite hydraulic fracture, that's, that's the model for the tip region, right? And then, then you get the solution, account the effect for effect of viscosity leak off, and that's what you use in, instead of this toughness. But the conceptually, the concept is the same. You know the width, and then you get uh, the distance to the front, OK? Uh, and here's a very big question. Why, why bother doing this, right? I mean, uh, what's the uh, what's advantage? And, and, and the key thing is to reduce mesh dependence. That's a key answer. If you want to reduce mesh dependence. And, and if you're in academia, you want to reduce mesh dependence so that for a given mesh, you can get a more accurate answer. If you're in an industry, you want to reduce mesh dependence so that you're given your tolerance, right? You want to increase your mesh so that you measure tolerance. And then if you increase the mesh, then you, you run faster, right? You run simulation faster. And so that, that, that's a big advantage to industry, okay? So here's a, a picture from, from this paper by, by Le Campion and others. Uh, they did a study uh, some time ago on, on uh, error for a simple case of radial fracture and they show here the error of fracture radius for different approaches versus mesh, right? So this H is element size, R is radius. So how many elements you have per radius or inverse of that, right? So element size over the radius in order to have um, small radius in, in, in the radius, in, you know, small error in the radius, right? And so here's this ILSA, right? So there's a blue triangle pointing down. And as you can see, you have, even with say 0.1, which is 10 elements, you have about a few percent of error, right? So 10 elements per radius is, is sufficient to, to accurate, accurately capture fracture geometry, even for the simplest case. But if you do say this FEM cohesive zone model, I mean, for them, it's just few percent, it, it's 10 to the minus three, there's about a thousand elements. I mean, I think it's actually quite too high maybe, but, but um, and still you can see the difference, right? In other approaches, if you use wrong asymptote, this is use the LFEM. So if you use just toughness, then you use, need to use more elements and so on. So that's the thing, right? So to get the same answer, you, you can get this similar answer with few elements, right? And so, and so it means you can run it faster. And this is number of elements per radius, right? So total number of elements scales as square, right? So basically between 10 and 25, so the difference total number of elements is more like five and the computation time grows like number of elements squared, maybe even cubed sometimes. So that's like, um, like uh, 25 times faster, right? So that's a big deal, okay? And there's another thing. Um, so previous plot, I hope convinced you that if you use this um, uh, tip asymptote, right? So you account for the fact for strong pressure gradients near the tip, you, you uh, uh, converge quicker, right? So you get more accurate solution. Uh, that then comes layering, all right? And this goes back to my uh, previous work at, 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 at uh, Van Gonten, right? So maybe some of you remember my last year op talk or so this paper, but the idea is that, I mean, if, if you're looking at the shells, you, um, your um, shells are very heterogeneous, right? And heterogeneous at a very different length scale. So the question is, do you want to model this or are this important? Um, or, and then when you say you have your stress profile like this, again, if, again, if you have, if you believe in this model, so what would be the most optimal element size, right? Should it be one millimeter, one meter, 10 meters? And how coarse can you go, right? Um, should you try to match this large drop in stress or you shouldn't, right? Again, one way, again, was to use homogenization. That's what I uh, presented a year ago. But even with homogenization, you uh, you see you, you homogenous over a certain distance, over a certain length scale, your element size. And so this in intrinsically introduces some mesh dependence, right? So if your element size, you homogenous over, you know, this hundred feet, 
for instance, then you you your answer is essentially you accept to be plus minus 100 feet in your height, right? So so that's um, that's the thing, right? Uh, but again, it's not about high resolution model only. But you you, you must again if if you don't believe that this is what is happening, and, and say you like uh, to work with upscaled model, or that's what you prefer to do, or you don't have a data, it doesn't matter. The, the questions are still the same. What is the optimal uh, element size? Do you want to have certain number of elements per layer? Do you want to have an integer number of elements per each layer? But uh, say, I mean, you, your, your layer size could be so different that you, I mean, you need to, will probably need to stretch some elements to manage this, the boundaries. And what if you have a thin layer, right? A very thin interface, how would you, how would you do it in this case, right? So that's a, all very valid questions. And, and, and again, I, I want to motivate here that layering is a potential source of mesh dependence, okay? The way you deal with layers, okay? Whether you upscale or, or don't upscale, you change or you, you 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 change your element size and so on. Uh, this is potential source of, of mesh dependence again on top of uh, effects of like viscosity and strong pressure gradients near the tip. Okay. Now let's go back to the title, right? So um, so what I want to talk about is continuous front tracking algorithm, right? So so so, the, so this first part means I want to address this fracture front related mesh dependence, right? So I want to make sure that I track the fracture front continuously. And the second one is multi-layer tip elements, right? Or multiple. Uh, this here, with this part, I want to address this layering related mesh dependence, right? So that we so that we don't need to be thinking about all this question that I outlined on, on the previous slide. And so the main question is why not ILSA? Because again, ILSA is is what is known so far as 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 you know, the best way of, 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 of tracking the fracture front. Here are my motivation, right? First of all, it has been done before and even more than once, right? So if if I would just do ILSA, I wouldn't be presenting it today, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, we need to move forward. So I wanted to take this as an opportunity to develop something new, right? So I think that's um, my first motivation. Second, the tip elements are not independent, right? And And because again, for me, it's not like about developing simulator from scratch, it's about implementing into existing rest frac. And, and uh, this would require very serious surgeries in the solver, very serious changes in the solver, uh, because you're, I mean, on how you, um, how you dependent and independent variables are structured. And, and third, I didn't think about a simple way how to incorporate the effect of all these layers, okay? Um, and so, so these are the three reasons why I didn't choose ILSAM. So, so now you will hopefully enjoy this, this, this new algorithm, right? So first I'm gonna talk about this test problem, a simple problem of a plane strain uh, hydraulic fraction. And then I will go to our rest fraction implementation, show you some um, you know, nice uh, 3D images. So think about it, have a plane strain fracture as shown here on the left, you inject somewhere fluid, it propagates up and down. And now you, you, your stress is layered, your toughness and leak of Carter's leak of coefficient are layered but the elastic properties are constant, okay? And, and uh, you want to solve this problem and, try and, and, and uh, with, again, this classical, um, in classical equations here, again, Carter's leak of point source, Newtonian fluid, linear elasticity, uh, uh, linear elastic fraction mechanics at the fracture tip and so on. And you want to solve this problem and try to um, you know, reduce mesh dependence for, uh, for this problem. And by the way, we just, Posted an article online on which, which has all these details. Here's an archive right uh, link here, uh, which has all the details about this problem and and, and the algorithm as well. Um, so and it's it's full open. You, yeah, it has all the details. You can you can open and, and read it for uh, for yourself if you miss something. So continuous front tracking. So here, let me start by uh, showing you an observation. Right. So what if we have a uniformly pressurized fracture shown here left, right? Uh, before propagation, and then suddenly some step, uh, you want to propagate this fracture by a single element, right? Um, and again, you don't inject anything, you just imagine you are after the time step, you already injected everything, and now you just, just want to propagate, okay? Uh, now, if you create an additional element here with element size H on both sides, then because of uh, uh, uniform pressure or, or toughness domination, you suddenly jump in fracture lengths and suddenly drop in fracture width because you conserve the volume, right? Uh, and uh, that's a very big change, right? It's a very big discrete change in, in, um, in fracture behavior, again, pressure, in, uh, in length and the width, right? And let's try to think about how to mitigate this 
And, and the idea is the following. What if we add some penalty stress or additional stress near the tip, right? So in this case, you numerically create an element, but because you create this additional stress with just the right magnitude, you keep this element fully closed. And because you, feel, uh, you keep it fully closed, your global fracture behavior is not going to change, you know, it, or it's not going to change abruptly. Right? So maybe you're going to have some some minor variation near the tip, but the global width and pressure and 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 and, and, and you know the whole response of the fracture is not going to change. Right? So that's the concept. And 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 the question is, how do you compute this penalty stress, and how do you uh, change it? Because now what you can do is you can gradually decrease this stress, and by gradually decreasing stress, you're going to open this element, tip elements more and more and more. And so that's how you effectively gonna continuously propagate the fraction, right? And that's how you continuously go say here from, um, from, from, from red to, to blue dash line, right? By continuously changing the stress, okay? That's the one idea. The question is how to compute it. And so, so to compute it, we go back to the problem. Again, I promised to show you some math, so, so here you go. Uh, we go to the problem of uniformly pressurized semi infant fraction, okay? And for, for some generality, you just add a stress barrier here. So think about, you have a, this is fracture width near the tip. So have this H as your element size. And here you have H times F, F being the fill ratio. So degree of you fill the element, so it's from zero to one. Uh, so zero means you just enter the element one, is you're about to exit the element. And uh, luckily for us, there's an analytic solution. So, so you know exactly what the width looks like near the tip, right? Just, just an analytical solution. And there's some function F is a horrible function, but again, we know it, okay. Now, you see, if you have a numerical scheme, right? So again, you have to numerically have this full element, right? So, so you have to, you know, move the fracture front all the way to, to the edge of the element, right? Again, because, well, it's numerically how you do it. But we want to make sure that, that the far field behavior of fracture doesn't change. And it's similar between these two cases, right? And so as I said, what we do here is, for this kind of simulated numerical solution, we apply a different magnitude of stress, but because it's different because we move the fracture front and now we, we, we apply a penalty for moving the fracture front. But again, because um, even if you have a different magnitude, we still know that it's exactly the same form of the solution, but, but we just don't know the toughness here right? because it's no longer, uh, you know, a stress intensity factor should no longer be required equal to the toughness at the tip. And, and we don't know the magnitude of, 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 of this, this additional penalty stress, okay? And so and now I want to make these two solutions equivalent. And, and what we're saying is that we need to match the far field behavior. So here on, the, on, on this picture, we have this dashed red line is uh, the true solution that we want to approximate. And the black is actually what we are um, using. And so we match the far field behavior and, and we match the volume of the tip element, right? So basically we integrate the solution from, you know, this this black solution from the tip to, you know, up to all the way up to here. And we, we, we integrate the similar solution again, all the way over the tip element. So again, there are two equations to unknowns. And then if you solve, I mean, you get, you get what you want, right? You get the magnitude of, of the stress, you know, how much you need, how much penalty you need to apply to compress the tip element. And you do it as a function of the fill ratio. Okay, how much you fill it. So let's go and, and, and see what, uh, how does this function look like, okay? So we have two contributions. So the first penalty is, is due to toughness. So we have essentially toughness divided by square root of element size uh, times uh, you know this function sigma k. And the second penalty is due to stress because we are entering a stress barrier or stress drop. And this is a you know, second penalty. So um, so we see that, that as soon as we have a newly created element has fill ratio of zero, nearly zero, that, that, that's the situation, right? Uh, we have the largest contribution or the largest penalty because uh, again, we are, we are moving essentially the front fracture front backwards by one element. But also we actually don't feel the stress barrier, right? Because the stress barrier starts here. And, and, and that's why the Sigma S, the effect of, of stress barrier is zero, okay? And then as we gradually open up this element and go all the way to the end of the element, now the penalty for moving the fracture front is zero, right? So the Sigma K goes to zero, right? Um, it's a linear function with respect to this f to the power of three halves, but the effect of stress goes to one, right? So, so essentially our penalty stress is equal to the stress barrier, right? Because again, you have fully opened the element. Okay, so these are these are these two functions, very nice and 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 um, you know and, and smooth. Um, but there is a problem because again, these these expressions are based on theoretical solutions, and 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 
and and uh, they don't account for the discretization error. Discretization error comes into play because uh, we are looking at the tip elements. Basically, we have just two elements, right? And 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 I mean, as as, as most of you know, that 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 with two elements you cannot have a you know. I mean, you do have a strong discretization error, right? So so we need to have a correction for discretization. And and so what I did is I tried to do solve a similar problem, but numerically with displacement discontinuity method, and try to get this function numerically. Okay. So 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 the procedure was the following, and just just roughly. So, so you, you set your mesh like 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 here. You have your whatever uh, six elements. Uh, you get um, uh, you know decide on your fracture length. So this is German's your fill ratio where you're here or here. Okay. And then you know the exact solution, analytic solution for uniformly pressurized fracture should be an uh, elliptical, right? Uh, for this case, if you don't have a stress barrier, but even with stress barrier, you know it. And then you numerically compute the magnitude of stress that you need to have in order to match the volume of the tip element and the global volume of the fracture. And then you just, just plot them and then fit a straight line and, 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 and you have it. And then the idea is that, that the theoretical solution is, is very good in giving you the form of the answer, but the numerical coefficients are off, but maybe 20, 30, 40%. Um, and so, but once you fix the numerical coefficients, then, then you're good to go. Okay. Um, so this is again the last. I think the last slide with, with Martin. Then we will go into nice, um, um, nice pictures, nice results. So all of this before, what I showed, it was true for toughness-dominated solution. It means we don't have effect of fluid viscosity, and we don't have the effect of actual layers, like of thin layers within the element. And for these two, we need to do some corrections for this um, stress expression. And again, all the details are in, in this archive paper. I'm not going to go into a lot of them, but you're just going to show you some. Uh, so the first is uh, the fact of viscosity is is captured by the, this additional term is fact, basically like effect of apparent toughness. Um, so if you have more viscosity in, in the fracture, your fracture wants to be wider. So effectively, your toughness is, is increased. And so this de uh, function depends on uh, the uh, velocity of tip propagation. That's why we have this new fill ratio versus previous time step fill ratio. It gives you velocity and all these material properties like viscosity and, and stuff like this. And the second one, if you have, first of all, if you have toughness layers, right, you always use the local value of toughness based on the fill ratio, right, because you know where your fracture front is because that's your fill ratio from zero to one. So you always know um, local value of fracture toughness, that's what you use. And then you also use the correction from uh, stress layering, okay? I mean, this is becoming my, one of my favorite equations. It's basically your correction to stress intensity factor Due, uh, for semi-infinite fracture uh, due to some you know, stress loading, right? And, and let me just give a little bit more motivation to, uh, to this term. So I just showed you that we know the solution for this problem, right? So we know how to approximate it with this penalty stress method, right? So when you have fracture and there's a stress barrier and there are no more layers, okay? The reality is that this like thinner black lines show, shows our stress layering, right? This is our reality, right? We, have, we can have multiple layers, okay? Uh, this bold uh, black lines show the averages, right? So we basically have weighted average over the previous element and over the tip element up to the fill ratio, okay? And, and so what we do is we do a correction for the difference between this reference stress, which, which is bold um, and black lines and the actual stress. So, so we do this correction to the stress intensity factor and then put it to extra fracture toughness, okay? So that's what this term represents. And, and after all of that, the actual numerical algorithm fills only this thing. So, so for the previous tip element, uh, for the previous element before the tip, we apply just average stress. And for the tip, we have all this kind of complex equation, which accounts for layers, layers and stress, layers and toughness and, and, and viscosity and so on. Okay. So that's, again, if you miss any technical details, it's gonna be, uh, that there is this publication in archive, you, you're welcome to, uh, to, um, to read it. And also, I'm not going to say much about Likov, um, but, but the idea is that, again, I mean, you also, as, you, as you propagate through the Likov layers here on the tip, you, I mean, you track your, uh, when you cross different layers, and that's you essentially, in Carter's model, you integrate things uh, numerically, okay? And for rest brackets, you know, it's slightly different because you have uh, just, just coupling with this matrix element. But again, you can look at, the, at this, this write-up on, on archive, okay? So now we are uh, done with equations. So now we can all relax and enjoy um, our beautiful pictures. But but before that, let's let's let me tell you briefly out on the algorithm and why it is um, somewhat simpler than ILSA, right? It's similar uh, than ILSA because it is local, right? Because your um, your tip element 
the, basically the volume of tip elements or, or the width depends its uh, evolution, right? So, so, so the algorithm is the following. So you update, send on iterations on time step, update the width or volume of the tip element, okay? And then what you do is you solve this complex equation, which, which I showed in our previous slide, to, to so you solve it for the new fill ratio. So you, given the new volume, you compute how far you propagate, okay? And then once you know this, you compute this penalty stress, and then you also compute leak off, right? Uh, but mostly, I mean, the most important thing so far is penalty stress. And now we feed this back to the main solver. So for the main solver, you actually, main solver doesn't know much about uh, the steep element, except that it just wants to know this penalty stress. So, so, so you can have your regular discrete uh, solver, I mean, discrete approach, I mean, right? So uh, in infrastructure propagation, then you just apply this variable uh, tip stress, and and then and then you'll be you'll be good to go, right? So that's why it's easier. It's an easier coupling. Okay. So here's some benchmarking. So just just to convince you that that it is sufficiently accurate. So so it's still for plane strain. Okay. Um, so here's a parametric space for plane strain fracture. So I worked with, on it bacon and when I was uh, at UH. So but the idea is that we have toughness dominated here, no leak off, viscosity dominated, no leak off, toughness dominated, high leak off, and viscosity dominated, high leak off limits, and then you want to probe kind of close to them and in between so that you uh, you know that your solution is good for all parameters. No layers so far. Okay, so all these five points, and I compared to the reference solution here, I'm plotting length versus time for all these five. On the left, I plot the width versus time in the well bore and efficiency. So efficiency is your fracture volume divided by the injected volume. So if it's one, there is no leak off. If it's like 0.1, it means you inject one and then only 0.1, 10% uh, stays in the fraction, 90% leaks off. And here I use huge element size. I mean, relatively speaking, it's 50 meters. And, and here you see your fractional length is for, for half length, right? From like about 150 to like 350, right? So you have just a few elements per half fractional length and you still match all the solutions reasonably. I mean, you do see a little of wiggles when, when you entering a new element, right? That's, uh, that's okay, right? Um, but they are, they are relatively minor, okay? I mean, if you had discrete, I mean, you'd have just staircase um, behavior for the length versus time, right? And the width will sell a little bit higher, but, but well, I mean, it is what it is, right? Um, here's, again, an, another example, I just want to convince you, it's, it's a simple case still, but I want to convince you that we can capture the effect of thin layers, because again, this is multi-layer tip elements, right? So, so we account for all these thin layers, no matter how thin they are within the tip elements. But as soon as you're inside, I mean, it's internal element, you, you just basically average all the properties and this is fine. But for the tips, we account for all the, explicitly for all the layers. So I can consider an example with the following rock properties. You have a thin layer of toughness barrier, thin layer of leak of barrier, and a thin layer of stress barrier. I think they were about 10 meters each. Uh, and, and I run the simulation with different elements, 100 meter element, 50 meter element, 25 meter elements, right? So inject at zero, and then here's the, the final width for all these three um, cases. Here we have a length versus time. So you see that we first grow and then we reach the leak of barrier here at about minute seven or 10. And then all three measures show the, and how we slow down again, no matter how element, how small large element size is. And then we reach the toughness uh, layer or barrier at the top at about the same time. And then we reach the stress barrier here at about minute 25. Again, we cross it again and see how, cross it, how we cross it differently, right? Here the toughness, we just basically, we just, just, just completely stop. And then we just cross here, kind of stress better, we gradually cross it and so on. And efficiency, right? So you start leaking off at once you leak, uh, reach the leak off layer about minute 10. Again, the all three cases and match are reasonably well. So again, and the, the fascinating thing here is that again, you have layers of which are 10 meters thick and you have a, um, an algorithm which numerically uses elements which are 100 meters in length, and then you can capture all this thing, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's very, very fascinating. And, and by the way, the computation time, I mean, you don't add much of the computation time because, because you have all this, you know, smart tip logic. I mean, you may have, I mean, you do add, but, but not a, a whole lot, right? And, and so you may have a lot of layers and you can still have, you can use coarse mesh and I have very accurate answer. Here's another example, if you like thick layers or, or big layers. And again, it's, it's very, very similar uh, situation, I mean, on the woods here, I mean, don't get um, uh, you know, frustrated with this kind of straight lines because the element size, uh, you know, it's 100 meters and this, this scale is in meters. So, so we have just, just like 
four or five elements per, per height, so that's why. And we connect the just with, 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 with straight lines, so that's why. But again, situation is very similar. So we have very, very similar behavior, right? And again, for all these cases, uh, we don't necessarily precisely match. Actually, for this case, we match uh, layer boundaries. Yeah, for this case, we match layer boundaries. Uh, but we don't have to, okay? Now, what if we could go um, a little bit wilder? Uh, here, I just, just, just generated this um, profiles of toughness, stress, and leak of using just random numbers. I, mean, I didn't take any, any field data or anything, but I just wanted to see how do, uh, how do we, um, how does it all work if you have a lot of, a lot of layers, right? I mean, because if you look at all this mess, you don't see any barriers or any, any problems, but apparently when you simulate it, um, you realize, oh, wow, I have a barrier right here, right? And I have a barrier right here, okay? Uh, so again, you don't have identical results, but they are very, very close in terms of your leak off, in terms of your, I mean, your, your barriers and so on, in terms of your, your behavior, right? So very, very, very close. And again, here you're talking about two meter layers and you simulate it with 100 meter elements, you have 50 layers per, per element, right? So that's, that's a lot. Uh, now let's move on to implementation of uh, a planar fraction, right? And again, I don't, I'm not gonna tell a whole lot about it. Um, and again, uh, again, all this write up before, it's, it's, which, which I showed before in the archive is for, for plane strain fracture, but conceptually for planar fracture situation is, is very similar, okay? Uh, so I wanted to, see how can we do it with, um, how to put it, maybe with the least effort possible or how to make it uh, in, in the simplest way possible. Although I'm not sure it's the simplest way, but you know, one of the simplest way possible, okay? So what I say is that each tip element can have multiple fill ratio that correspond to propagation in different directions. For instance, imagine, so, so you write as your fracture front and, and now you have this element. Uh, now you'd solve independently for the fill ratio for fracture propagating left and of course, you don't have layers, right? Geological layers propagate left or up. In this case, if you propagate up now, you start feeling less. And you solve this independently, right? So you don't solve for diagonal propagation, so on, just solve independently, okay? Uh, and uh, this is not precise for this diagonal element, but if you think about the following, so if you have ports of, portions of the fracture propagating predominantly up, it's gonna be precise. If you have portions of the fractures predominantly propagating, say, left or right, it's gonna be precise. And in between, you're just interpolating, okay? And so if you're interpolating between two correct uh, solutions, in, in, in a sense, I mean, you cannot be too far off, right? So, so think about this as interpolation procedure, okay? But the idea is, again, so instead of one fill ratio, you have two, sometimes we have three uh, independent fill ratios, so then you update them the same way as you did for plane strain fracture, okay? And then based on these two guys, you, you, you define a point. A point is gonna be your front point, okay? But based on how much fill you have in different directions. And then what you do is you basically connect the dots, right? So for all the tip elements, you have this, your, your point, and then you connect uh, the dots, that's your fracture front. And the key thing is how to compute the stress here because, right, okay, you update fill ratio, but you need to have a single value of stress for this element. And again, it's done by interpolation because once you have the fracture front, you know the directions. So you can take this intersection, this intersection, get a straight line, you get a direction, and then you interpolate by your direction um, was I use you know this steep stress penalty stress for 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 upward direction or for horizontal direction, so that's that's pretty much it. So the concept is uh, very simply extended to a planar fracture or multiple fra fractures as well. And again, as I just said, this is rigorous for uh, for vertical and horizontal direction and becomes approximate for this kind of like diagonal propagation. But we'll see how it performs, right? So so I mean approximation is not necessarily bad. So here, that's how it performs. Uh, this now is picture from ResFrag, our uh, user interface. With, we are, we're doing a radial fraction, uh, benchmarking for the viscosity dominated case. Uh, here on the bottom, plot radius versus time. And, and this, this marker is a reference solution. So again, we match even with about like three, four elements per, per radius. Again, we do see the boundaries uh, of the elements a little bit, but again, it's not um, you know, a huge error. And uh, here, just again, to, to, to emphasize what you're looking at, again, it's radial fracture at different times. And the actual single element is, is, is square here. I mean, in general, it can be rectangular. And all these triangles are just for visualization, right? Just, 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 just to make a, a you know, some smoother look. So you're talking about, uh, I don't know, like here, like five elements per diameter, and, and you still um, and you have a good radial shape. Again, you're interpolating here, but it's still good. And now you have a little bit more elements, a little more elements. And 
here I'm just drawing circles on top to just to convince you this is a radial. Okay, and the radial case is arguably one of, of the hardest uh, because again, for again for vertical propagation for horizontal, as I said, I mean we are uh, precise. And then for when, once you want to smooth the corners, this diagonal propagation that's when you when approximation kicks in, and and, and we are doing a reasonably good job here. So so that's that, that that's good. Okay. Um, and then again, imagine if you have more complex field field fractures. I mean, in, in many cases we have layers, the height contained again. So they so they are basically you have combination of kind of flat se section fractures and then kind of curved, and the curves are represented by the radial fracture. That's why it's, it's, you know, it's a good fundamental case. But you can actually go a little crazy and say, oh, what if I have aspect ratio, element aspect ratio? Here's element aspect ratio is five, which is which is very high. I mean, like very high. Um, so you can see this element here, and you can still you know, reasonably do uh, radial fracture. I mean, not as good as, as, as the square elements, but still, um, you know, reasonable, maybe within 10%, you, I mean, you get your radial fracture, but I mean, you start seeing uh, some asymmetry, but, you know, it's aspect ratio of five. I mean, it, it's not like even, even two is high, but this is five. And I did simulations with 10 and still, um, you know, look somewhat similar. So, so that's, uh, that's, you know, good sign. So let's do, uh, again, a little bit more uh, nice uh, example. So, so here's, uh, now again from Restfrag uh, user interface, as you can see you have a very nice uh, images, a constant height fraction. So here, these little ones are the new matrix elements. So we have a uh, different fracture toughness, you know, above and below, and we inject somewhere in the middle, and then we propagate this constant height fracture, and we do it with different element size. And of course, I mean we do feel this layer boundary exactly, um, and we stop propagating like like in the middle of the element, right? So the fracture height is 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 captured precisely, right? So fracture height is, is, is 240 in feet. And so with the element size 100 feet, you have like 2.4 elements per, per height. And, and then I just run several cases and, 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 and look at the final fracture lengths just to see how good are we doing in terms of mesh dependence. And, and you can see that the results are pretty consistent. I mean, I mean, you have a little bit of, of wiggle here, maybe 1% in length, uh, but again, you can have two and a half elements per height and, and you get, and you get Answer to within one percent correct. I mean that 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 that's a lot. Okay, that that that's the benefit of this algorithm. Then you can do um, stress barriers again. A simpler case. Uh, you have again here you have matrix elements in color. So blue is your main stress layer, and then you have stress above a little bit higher and stress below much higher. Um, again, this is your, how how you, how your width looks like. And uh, again, you have very coarse elements. And you do see a little bit of propagation towards high uh, stress zone and much more propagation towards, towards this yellow kind of less high stress zone. Um, but again, if you look at the uh, half length and, and height above, here's above well bore, um, they are um, uh, reasonable. Okay? I mean, they are not too far off. And I mean, they actually oscillate a little bit. Uh, but again, it's, it's all about how your elements align with respect to layers. I mean, they do oscillate a little bit, but, but they, they are um, very, very close. And here on the bottom, I plot, again, the length and, and half height versus time for all these three cases. Again, you do see, again, especially in closer to toughness dominated regime, you start having you know, more of these wiggles. Um, but, but again, you, you see the element size, but, but you're talking about like two, three elements per height. So that's, 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 that's very good. And then of course, if you decrease the element size, I mean, they, they just become absolutely smooth, okay? Uh, finally, I have um, this case I called Matryoshka doll, <laughs> but uh, but um, essentially I want to see the performance of the algorithm for single fractures still when you cross a thin high stress layer. Okay, um, so we have so we inject here in, in this orange layer with lower stress, and then we have thin barrier, and then we have uh, lower stress, and then even lower stress above. Okay. And again, it's the same uh, situation here. We have three different element size, plot half lengths above and half lengths and height above. And we have, um, we have a little bit more discrepancy here, uh, but still uh, the results are very consistent, especially between 50 and 25 foot, um, foot elements. So, um, and again, again, you're talking about, you're crossing a layer which is 20 feet high with elements which are like 100 feet, 50 or 25, right? So, I mean, if you would do this with conventional um, you know, algorithm, you know, a conventional simulator, you'd probably need to have two to three elements per layer, right? So you're talking about element size of, I don't know, five feet, seven feet, um, but now you can do it with 100 feet or 50 feet, right? So that's, again, that's that's advantage of this algorithm. 
And of course, it's, it's part of RESFRAG. So this, this is one of my last slides. So, so I mean, I showed you the cases where it's simple uh, single fracture, but, but you can do multiple fractures, multiple wells. It's all embedded into reservoir simulators. So you can do production and so forth. I mean, there are a lot, a lot of physics in RESFRAG and it's all, all in there. Uh, but from algorithm point of view, I also want to emphasize things like fracture merging, right? So you may, you may uh, merge two fractures between um, you know, two different wells if you have direct fracture heat. And again, this is something that you know algorithm can can handle. And again, it's not it's not trivial, right, to, to implement this. So that's my uh, last slide summary. Uh, thank you all for listening. So let me remind you what what was talked this about. So um, this talk was about a new continuous front tracking algorithm, right? And the concept that it uses is this penalty stress. So again, it's, here's the concept we just outlined here. So so you you assign an additional stress to tip elements and prevent them from being full open right away, right? So kind of control the opening of the steep elements. And it's arguably easier to implement into an existing simulator. And, and I would say this difficulty level is the same or it's very similar as cohesive zone model, right? Because that's what you do in cohesive zone model. Uh, you have some sort of traction separation law, but you know, from implementation point of view, it's the same. It's just, you have different um, interpretation of what you're doing. And uh, the coupling with the main simulator is local, right? So basically your your local aperture here uh, determines front evolution, it determines this penalty magnitude, stress magnitude, right? It's very local, so it's easier to implement. And well, I'll anticipate this question, so, so, so I answer it right away. So this concept conceptually should be applicable for other numerical approaches, such as finite element or discrete element method, at least for rectangular measures, right? So, but, but the stress functions need to be recalibrated for this case. Uh, another thing which I can really like is, is there is multi-layer tip elements approach. And again, I was thinking about it a long time ago. This again picture from my paper from my UH days, that you know, some if you're inside the fracture, you can you can homogenize or average your properties. It's 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 not a big deal. But for the fracture tip, you really need to account for all these layers. Um, and 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 so that's how that's when this concept of multi-layer tip elements come into place. Um, it allows you to reduce uh, to account for many layers within the tip elements and to reduce mesh dependence associated with layers. And again, you don't need to upscale the data. You can just, just put whatever you have to it and it's gonna be fine. Uh, there are also many, like many technical issues uh, which are related, um, you know, like things like fracture merging, convergence and so on. And visualization is not, it's very far from trivial, uh, but you know, these are, you know, like technical issues that are emitted here. And of course, this algorithm is implemented in RESFRAG. It's not fully released. We, have, we still have some issues to, um, to um, I mean, that's why I said is there are many technical issues you think you conceptually you are done, you are done a long time ago, but uh, you know, for con a commercial simulator, it has to be robust work for all cases and so on. So, so once we solve all this is gonna be uh, released and available. So thank you. Thank you for all attention. So I'll be happy to answer all questions. Well, Igor, thank you. Uh, you know, really, I think everyone online can, can uh, uh, appreciate the uh, clear explanation you gave of something that, has a, a very uh, complex, uh, is very complex under the surface. Um, uh, despite that clear explanation, I, I think people um, uh, would value uh, a little bit of clarification on a couple of issues. And, and so the first question is from Reza Safari and, and he appreciates the presentation. And his question is, he wants to know um, about the tip element behavior and should we change the behavior from linear to quadratic? Should we also change the type of penalty function from constant to quadratic? Right, so that's that's, that's absolutely a valid question, right? So, so this all was done for um, constant uh, TDs, right? So we use displacement discontinuity approach with constant elements, right? So again, conceptually, it should work for any elements, right? But, but you will need to recalibrate these functions, right? So, so if you go back, uh, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna they take some time. So if you go back to uh, this uh, penalty functions, so I first had theoretical expressions, right, and then and then um, and, and then I had uh, practical expressions, right. So, so all you need to do is to recalibrate these based on the method that you are using. Okay, uh, so it's just where was it here, right? So these were where is it? So these were theoretical expressions, right? We should again, be roughly correct for, for all simulators, right? But because we have discretization error and it varies whether you use linear elements, quadratic elements or whatever you use, 
uh, then these coefficients are going to be different, right? So, so, so that's that's my and it also depends on the method. If you use finite element, if you use discrete or use DAM or use DD, I mean, you just need to recalibrate these coefficients. So that, that, that's my answer. Thank you. Um, the the next question is from Ed Siebritz and. Ed, Ed is Ed has committed to reading the paper as soon as this call is over. <laughs> uh, but he, what he would like to know is how do the corrections work when you have a thin layer? And, and his, his rationale for asking that question was, are the corrections not based on a semi-infinite configuration? And, and you have examples, and, and maybe you showed some, I think, actually showing how your numerical scheme compares with other published um, schemes for uh, thin layers. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's again it's hard, uh, but let, let me try to explain. So essentially, first we derive and, and calibrate the following solution, right? If you have no layers except just one, so you you essentially you grow into a stress barrier or stress drop. Okay, so that so we divide we def, define the penalty stress for this, and then we try to uh, get the um, layering is, is, is got through the corrections, right? So first of all, again, so we have this toughness here, right? If you have toughness layers, you just use local value of toughness of depending on where your front is, right? So if your front is say here, or I'll say it's here, right? Then you use this value of toughness. Once your front jumps here, then you use local value of toughness. So again, the expression is the same, but these coefficients in the expression, they change at the function of your field ratio of front position, okay? So that's how you account for the effect of thin layers. And in this case, it doesn't matter how many layers you have, you just need to use the local value of, of, of toughness. Again, when with stresses, it's a little bit more, more complex um, because you need to, instead of using the local stress, you, uh, you still use average stress, but to use a correction, again, to toughness, okay? So that um, uh, you account for the stress intensity factor difference between the actual thin layer configuration and, and an average configuration. So, but fundamentally, fundamentally, okay. So you are propagating essentially through um, through a medium with variable toughness, okay. So, 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 so you put everything, all the stress layers, and toughness layers, into variable heterogeneous toughness, okay. And that, and, and, but then again, I mean, instead of being a constant here, this now becomes function of front position. And so, but that, that's, that's pretty much it. And again, um, I'll be happy to discuss it in further once, once you read this, this uh, article. So, I mean, it's, it's a little hard to grasp all, all of it uh, right from presentation, I mean, I, I admit it. So, so Igor, the next question is from Alexei Savitsky. Um, and Alexei, um, congratulate you on a great presentation and, and expresses thanks. And, and he wants to know about the impact of, of runtime when this is installed in, in ResFrac and um, the balance that this would allow you to do uh, higher use higher resolution data like less than a meter. Right, so it's very a valid question. Again, we are, we, are, we are looking into it again right now. Um, again, it, it hasn't been released because uh, it's, you know, it, um, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it has some issues with uh, convergence, right? So, so we don't it basically it runs suboptimally. So I cannot tell you the numbers, but again, if you run optimally, right? So you don't, you don't have failures or anything like this, then then again, so you make your 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 element size, your actual element size coarser. I mean, again, maybe by a factor of two or so, or maybe you can have some more aspect ratio, and and, and then you can. That's how you gain the computation time, but but. It's, I really need to test how coarse can you go. I and mean, then probably different people will have uh, different feelings, but uh, my, my anticipation that, that, that um, I mean, you can go, I know several times faster. Again, I mean, you can stretch the several from, from maybe two to 10. Again, it depends how coarse uh, will you be able to go. <clears throat> because again, everything is very nonlinear uh, depending on, on the element size. If you coarse in the factor of two, you, uh, you, you get more than four times faster, right? And the algorithm itself doesn't add much of, of, of additional computation time. I mean, if you start having thousand layers per, per element, then maybe, but but uh, but if you have like a reasonable number of layers per, per element, it doesn't add that much additional um, runtime. Great, thank you. Um, and Anthony Pierce has a couple of more 
of more technical, specific technical questions. And he's interested in how does uh, F, FL and how do FL and FU compare with a fill fraction based on a linear front and with a given orientation as is done in Nilsson. Oh, this is more for planar, um, okay. This one, right? So the question is how do these compare with the actual fill fraction? Right, it's 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 um, a good question, but I think it it, it really depends on, on how your your fracture front is 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 propagating. So, I mean, I didn't do detailed comparisons, but but I mean, I do have uh, you know look at, at the actual field fraction and the kind of interpolated field fraction, and they do vary, you know, quite notably occasionally because you may have um, you know like imagine if you put this uh, this dot a little bit lower. Right, you may have you know, the actual field fraction is going to be very small, but your your like kind of left and up are going to be quite high. Okay, so so we do see um, um, you know some difference, but the question is why do we need to worry about it? Because much that we need to worry about it is actually the stress. Okay, so that the, the stress that we apply is is you know it's reasonable, right? It's it giving us the right answer. So that's so. I don't worry much about the actual field fraction of, of the of the element, but we can discuss it further. I mean, if again, if it doesn't fully answer the question. Will link. Okay. okay. There was a second question. Uh, the, the Anthony did have have a, have a second question, and 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 that was um, going to slide ten, and in slide ten, he's interested in how does the penalty stress delta sigma. Um, F force the width in the dashed red line to be zero at the front H sub F. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I don't know if it's slide 10. I, I, I think it might be even <laughs> okay. further down. Well, further. conceptually, anyway. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's about slide 20. You go to even when you started yeah. the... right so the question is how can you fully compress it yeah further down the, the next slide maybe the next one this one no the next one next one yeah that one so the dashed red line oops the previous line this one no the previous one Oh, yeah, that one. The dashed red line. Um, are you forcing the width to be? I mean, you forcing the tip to be zero there, or are you having a yeah, tip yeah. element go the whole length? Because I don't see how delta sigma f would force the tip to be zero, the width to be zero at the tip, if you've got a tip element that goes all the way. To I think there. it's 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 a very valid question, right? I, I think I think I understand where you're going. So if you do this theoretically. Okay, so if you apply too much stress, your actual, your actual solution uh, will go to negative widths. Okay, yeah, um, we'll go to negative. So you have some positive, some negative. And here I'm always talking about the the volume. So I always talk about the average. Okay, and so because you go positive and negative, the average can be zero. Okay, numerically, again, it, it doesn't happen, right? You cannot go to, to to zero, but but I mean you cannot go negative. But you have a constant width, right? So you can go exactly to zero. So again, in this theoretical, you can go, you know, locally, your width, you know, this black line can go negative. Okay. And that's I mean, it's it is what it is, right? But for numerical, when I did this uh correction, right? So you actually because you have the discrete, you have the average width, right? You have you have a you know discrete width for this element, for instance, you can make it exactly zero, right? So I don't know. Does this answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I, I I'm sure we'll talk about it later. Sure. But a nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and a couple more. Um, you Mesh had a question, and he's wondering about the feasibility or necessity of using some sort of pressure sensitive toughness. Pressure sensitive toughness. I haven't heard anything about pressure sensitive toughness, honestly. I mean, you can probably implement it if you want to, but but um, I, I wouldn't, why? 
I'm a little confused about the question actually. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, because we have things like um, length dependent toughness, right? So, so as your fracture grows and, and becomes longer, uh, at least in rest frac, you have a parameter you can change to increase toughness with fracture lengths, right? So if you have longer tough, longer fractures will experience um, more toughness. And I mean, it's, it's fully implemented, but uh, we don't have anything related to uh, pressure. Related pressure. So I, 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 the, the last part of Umesh's question was, or does it matter? And, and so uh, the, the, the sense is that it's, it's either not relevant or it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, the, the next question is from uh, Eduardo and uh, Eduardo congratulates you on a fantastic talk and, and an ingenious method. And his question is regarding your use of uh, the aperture asymptote at such coarse resolutions, especially in the toughness dominant regime. And he indicates that he would expect a linear elastic fracture mechanics asymptote to be very inaccurate so far away from the tip. And do you have an explanation um, as to how to maintain your accuracy? And did you ever wonder if energy-based methods would be desirable? Okay, so that's 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 wonderful question, right? So 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 again, it goes back to these technical details, which again is hard to work right away. Um, so I did the main development based on the toughness solution, right? Because it's easier to it's easier to do, right? I mean, you can do these analytic calculations. Uh, you can do this numerical checking for uniform uh, pressurized fracture. So it's much easier to do toughness. But then I do have this, you know, this little W tilde correction, and 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 so, so what it does, it actually we in, in, in not in, well in some ways implicitly use um, the true asymptote, okay, at least approximately near the tip, which accounts for viscosity and for leak of. Think about the following. So the meaning of this W tilde is the ratio between the true asymptote, okay, the true which accounts for uh, viscosity and leak of, you know, all these three, and toughness, right, all these three process asymptote, and the toughness asymptote, okay? And, and, and so if you take this ratio, it effectively becomes apparent toughness. So that's why we use toughness and multiply by apparent toughness, okay? But, but this, uh, you know, a way of, of incorporating uh, the effect of viscosity uh, in, into the solution, and again, we did benchmarking on a very coarse mesh for high viscosity, low viscosity, just to show that, that this approach actually gives a reasonably accurate results, right? So, so if, if I didn't have this term, I wouldn't be able, for instance, to see, to get the right fracture lengths uh, here with just like three elements per, uh, per half length, right? It would be significantly off. So, so the effect of viscosity is there, okay? Thank you, thank you, Igor. And I, I guess the last question was whether whether this this talk recorded talk will be available. Indeed, the talk has been recorded and it will be available through ARMA and 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 potentially on on ResFrax website. Is that is that the case? <clears throat> it, it, it'll be available regardless. Yes, it, it should be available on ResFrax as well. Yes. Okay, very good. So, so once again, Igor, uh, fantastic presentation. I mean, r really insightful and, and a clear explanation of some, some complex technologies. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Great job, Igor. Have a good day.